Now from CBS 4 News, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Good morning, I'm Jim DeFeedy and welcome to Facing South Florida. Burger King wants to be Canadian, eh? An incumbent falls on the Dade County Commission and we are now 65 days from what will surely be the nastiest, most expensive governor's race in the state's history. By the time it's all over, will any of us care about either of these candidates? But first, we talk to former Lieutenant Governor Jennifer Carroll, who is out with a tell-all book about her first two years with Governor Rick Scott, and it's not pretty. Carroll served 20 years in the Navy and spent seven years as a state legislator before being tapped by Rick Scott to be his running mate in 2010. She resigned in March 2013, and we'll get into why in a minute. But first, let me bring her in and by satellite from Jacksonville. Jennifer, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jim. So I want to talk, to, as I mentioned to you before, I just finished reading your book. It was very informative, and you were telling me that it was sort of therapeutic to write. Tell me a little bit more about that. Actually, it was. The book talks about my life story and being an immigrant coming to this country and some of the challenges I faced working as a woman in a male-dominated environment, being in the military and in politics. And it's, it's meant to be an inspirational, motivational literature piece so that I can share my life story with others to show them that through the, their faith and their strong spiritual connection that they can overcome challenges and be as great as they want to be. The things that I've gone through in my book of being an adopted child and unwanted sexual advancements and being in a good old boy system and, and having obstacles and barriers set there that if I can come out of it and, and still shine the way, the way I'm shining, that they can too. Because many people, particularly today with mental illness and depression, many people are unaware as to how they can build on their inner strength to overcome these adversities. Well, hey, me, I also uh, wanted no, no, to... No, no, let me sort of just sort of jump in, because I found the first part of your book where you talked about, you know, your growing up, the, the, the problems that you had in terms of your own father, and then, and then bringing, was very inspirational. And it's actually a story I was not that familiar with, which sort it gets me I want to sort of move forward just a little bit to just talk about your time as running for lieutenant governor because it seems as if you had a good story to tell you had things to contribute and yet as you were not really that partner that that you thought you were going to be when governor Scott or then Rick Scott tapped you to be his running mate I guess I want to ask you the first question I want to ask you is why do you think in hindsight Rick Scott picked you to be his lieutenant governor well, I thought at the time that it was with the, the various elements that I brought to the ticket, being a woman, being a Republican black female, being a veteran, being a legislator, that the experiences that I held in the Florida legislature will help him move his policies and agenda forward with our conversation. When we initially met, this is what he spoke up, that he wanted to, me to be an active role in helping him in the administration and changing the tide of Florida and bringing about jobs and changing Florida's economic climate. And I welcome that. But it was a, a little different serving in office when the controls more went to his chiefs of staffs. Now, I guess that's interesting. But you also had a feel that it wasn't going to be that partnership even during the campaign. You had suggested that there be, should be more of an outreach for Governor Scott in the African-American community, among women, in the Jewish community. And you were repeatedly shot down. You almost had to go rogue, to use Sarah Palin's term, to sort of try it on your own, didn't you? Well, as a matter of fact, that's what the whisper in the campaign was. She's going rogue when I was doing a stealth campaign to reach out specifically to the minority communities. And I firmly believe that helped us to, to be elected, uh, to get elected to office. Because when it was addressed to the, the strategists, they did not see a need for us to go directly, particularly to the black communities, because it was seen as if it was going to be fruitful work. But as it turned out, we received 6% of the black votes in the state of Florida. And I firmly believe is for the extra effort that I put forward in spite of the opposition for the strategists in the campaign. You sort of give a bit of a distinction between talking about those who operated behind the scenes in government, the, chief, the various chiefs of staff, the campaign managers, and Governor Scott himself. But it seems to me ultimately the buck should stop with the governor. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you as we were talking about minority outreach, do you think this governor, do you think Rick Scott cared about what was happening in the African-American community in the state of Florida? 
Well, I never asked him that pointedly, but I did ask his chief of staff with regards to an urban policy in if one was going to be, one was there and or was one going to be developed. And I was told uh, his jobs plan was his urban policy. I, that's where we differed because I felt that you cannot have a cookie cutter when it comes to economic development in the state. We have rural, urban, suburban areas. We have our inner city areas where you're going to have to have a different sort of plan to develop these areas economically, socially, and uh, a one size was not going to cut it for fixing the state of Florida with the diversity that we have in the state. You also said that the working environment in the Scott administration was the quote you had, it was a bold Boys club. Explain that to me. What do you mean by that? The good old boys club? Well, someone like me was not supposed to be elected lieutenant governor, a female, a minority, and it just was not received well. I don't believe it was received well with the good old boys in Tallahassee. As a matter of fact, Governor Scott wasn't received well as being an outsider. Uh, winning against someone that was perceived to be an insider. But uh, as things turned out, our staff became more of the insiders rather than what we ran on being outsiders and going to change the tide in Tallahassee. Now, so but, but with Governor Scott then realizing he was an outsider, you were a necessary welcome. Are you surprised? I guess what I get from your book is you were disappointed that the governor didn't do more in either defending you, coming to your aid, on all sorts of issues. Well, absolutely, and and part of the book I talk about and and spread and, and share the facts about some of the media uh, falsification or false information that was put out on me during my time in office. And being a team player, I was instructed not to defend myself and uh, just going along with the rules to not go rogue and hold my own press conferences and, and defend myself, I stayed silent. And that was a negative for me because th the media information is what stood and that's what people read about me and didn't know the, the truth. So therefore, I felt that the governor should have stood by my side and shared that he supported me and these allegations are not true so let's and talk he about should have defended me just like he did his chief of staff when his, his current chief of staff falsified his resume but the governor stood by him well, let's and talk when about, I saw that I go good, hmm? well, wait, I want to I wanted to give you time to address it so I want to let's talk about that you resigned on March 12th 2013 uh, because uh, well you resigned pr I guess let me, let's talk. Let's back up a second because I want to be clear about this. There was this there was a supposed scandal involving Allied veterans of the world, in which they were under FBI investigation, the Internet Cafe and fraud and a number of things dealing with them. You had worked as a PR consultant for them for two years back in 2009, 2010. Correct. You were never implicated in any wrongdoing as it related to what they were doing and what they were being investigated for. But one Correct. day. FDLE agents came to your office and interviewed you for 30 minutes about your association with the organization. Is that correct? Co correct. Did they tell you you were under investigation yourself or they, was it just no. fact finding? Fact finding. And then as soon as they literally walked out the door, the chief of staff and the general counsel for the governor walked into your office and handed you a, a letter with one sentence in which they told you the governor wanted you to resign and to sign this letter. Is that correct? Well, it, it, the sequence was, as soon as I opened my door, there was, stood in the outer office, the chief of staff, the governor's chief of staff, and the general counsel. They came into my office and noted that FDLE was there and commented, oh, what they want to talk about. So I shared with them what the information, the questions were, and they said, oh, by the way, we spoke with the governor days ago, and he would like to ask for your resignation. I was very stunned and surprised considering I said, what for? Well, he doesn't want this to be a distraction to him coming into the, the next session. And I said, but I haven't done anything wrong. And I said, well, we know, but he wants you to resign. What are you going to do at that point where the person that you work for, we all work at the, at the pleasure of the governor, doesn't want you there? doesn't see you as a valued asset and don't even have the respect to come to you directly to share this information with you as to what his desires are. You can talk to staff days prior to and not speak to me directly. I saw that as a slap in the face. Do you think in hindsight the governor just used you because you were a black female? Well I can't say that. It, it could certainly look that way but you know what? The chances that I had 
to make history, number one, of being the first black person ever elected in the state of Florida, being the first female to be elected as lieutenant governor, and the work that I did for the citizens of the state of Florida with Space Florida, with our military, with helping the governor, with expanding our international trade, I, I, I am pleased that I had that opportunity. So in that respect, I appreciate the governor having me on the ticket, but I don't appreciate in a way I which he asked me to leave office. You said in the book, you said, I felt as if I was treated like an unwanted stepchild. And, there, and there's a couple of telling moments in the book, too, where you talked about at one point you had blacked out and fainted in a bathroom and hit your head on the ground, and you had alerted the governor that this had happened, and you never received a call from him, never received any sort of sympathy from him, not even a check-in with you. Is that correct? No. That is truly correct. You know, I didn't think anything of it. I, that was my first time I've ever blacked out, and it was a concrete floor. It was a solid concrete floor, and I didn't, I, I didn't have any security with me in, in the restroom. So when I came to, I was laying on the floor, and when I told my daughter about it, she was very, very worried because she said, you have to get, your, you have to get a CAT scan to make sure you don't have any, any blood clots there because I wasn't even thinking that, of, that, of that possibility. But um, and that's serious enough in itself, particularly with him coming from a healthcare industry, to understand the criticality of a, uh, of a hard hit like that on the head. The other thing that I thought was interesting was you tried to connect with him on a personal level a number of times. And this is one of the things in the media we often talk about this, in you know, the public at large. One of the things that, you, that is with Governor Scott is there always seems to be that distance. But I've always thought, at least among those that were around him, maybe that wasn't the case. Maybe it was from an outsider's perspective. But here you were inside, in essence, and you said you tried on numerous occasions to make a personal connection with him, sending him even a little card or gift. You never received cards or gifts or not gifts, but at least cards for your birthdays or anniversaries. And then you wrote this as well. Clearly something was missing there, some ability to make a personal connection that he just didn't have. Why do you think that is? I don't know if it's his upbringing or if he allows the people around him to dictate who will get close, but I certainly, when his last couple of chiefs of staff came on board, that's when I saw the greater divide occur between us. But you have to have a willingness as whoever is the leader to say this is not the direction I want to go in. Or maybe you don't recognize it, which is even worse. You said, uh, you also wrote in your book that since you've left office, and by the way, after you left office, he kept the lieutenant governor position vacant for about 10 months, showing essentially his contempt for the position that he felt he didn't even need one. But you also said your replacement, Carlos Lopez Cantera, you've heard he's having it even worse. No security, no driver, you know, not really given much to do. Elaborate on that. What, what are you hearing about what Carlos Lopez Cantera from Miami is experiencing now that he's lieutenant governor? Well, from what I hear, he likes the position, but he's also having a little difficult time because he's being controlled by the staff as well. And in a, a news report the other day, they spent a little over twenty, what, twenty-six thousand dollars on security on him after uh, some death threats came about or threats came about to him and his family. But yet, still, over two point five million dollars was spent on the governor's security and over three hundred thousand dollars on the governor's wife's security. The lieutenant governor's life and his family's life is just just as important as the governor and his wife's life. Jennifer Carroll, I really do appreciate your taking the time to, to speak with us. It's a fascinating book. It is called When You Get There. And I guess the subtitle could be When You Get There. It may not be what you expected. Uh, <laughs> this is very true. Jennifer Carroll, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Have a great day. All right.